Hello, everybody. I'm Roger Brown. I'm the president of Berklee College of Music in Boston. And as most of you know, we also have a campus in Abu Dhabi in a beautiful Norman Foster design building. We have a wonderful team running that program. Gael Heading is our managing director. Gael is both a Grammy and Latin Grammy winner. And our artistic director is Mesa Kara, who's a beautiful, brilliant singer. Uh, you've probably heard her music in many, many different contexts. And today I'm bringing you one of our more famous young Berkeley alums, Charlie Puth. Charlie, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Charlie, uh, Charlie was at Berkeley just, we were figuring out maybe just six or seven years ago, and he's had an amazing mm -hmm. career, more amazing than I even knew when I saw it all in one place. Uh, he exploded onto the scene with this song, See You Again, that he and Wiz Khalifa did in the uh, one of the Fast and Furious movies. That song alone has had 7 billion streams. It's the number four song on YouTube. It was number one for a long time. I think we just broke 5 billion hits yesterday, actually, which is pretty, we're still breaking records on it, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. 5 billion streams. There are only 7 billion people on the planet. So what is wrong with these other 2 billion? They need to get get busy we, we, we need to we need to wake them up we need to glue them to their phones is what we need <laughs> to do but i think we're doing all right <laughs> and then uh my favorite record voice notes uh, had a bunch of hits on it attention went four times platinum how long two times platinum done for me all great songs what i realized is what a good bass player and drummer you are in addition to playing <laughs> keyboards your your bass lines are really amazing thank you and five billion seems to be a lucky number because that record has had five billion streams. Uh, and Charlie also just did a remix of a song with a young country artist, Gabby Barrett, and that's uh, become a big hit, mm -hmm. uh, which is a new territory for you. And the thing I've always been struck by, and this was true long before Charlie became a star, when he was a student, he had this posse of friends and they did fun projects together that were funny and musical. But since, uh, since he's left Berkeley, he's collaborated with John Perry, Kate, Katie, John Legend, Katy Perry, James Taylor, Elton John, Megan Trainor, Selena Gomez. Um, it's, just, it's just impressive. And the thing I will say, knowing Charlie from the inside out, is not only is he really effective in this role of being a, a multifaceted music star, he is a great writer, a great producer, an excellent pianist. He can sing. I remember when I first met you, you were a little uncomfortable singing. And, and I said, get out there and sing more, man. Uh, I was. You, yeah, I remember you telling me you got to sing more. Yeah. And uh, he's got engineering chops. You could be a com comedian if you chose to be. So this guy has an amazing range of gifts. So Charlie, say hello to everybody. And Hello, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here. And especially talking to you, Roger. I always love speaking to you. Yeah. Well, I wanted to start by saying, because of, we're in Abu Dhabi and Abu Dhabi has such a global multicultural quality to it. <clears throat> Talk a little bit about how your music, where has it landed around the world and what's been surprising to you in terms of, of where you've got an audience or, or a set of listeners that you wouldn't have guessed? Well, I'll start by answering that by talking about my first trip to Shanghai. I had never in back in 2015, I had never been to Asia. And I remember getting like I had a little bit of a, I had just started accumulating like a little bit of a um, outside of YouTube fan base. I had a mainly YouTube fan base and see you again had just come out. I was starting to uh, run into people on the street who were like, hey, you're that guy that sings that song like with the eyebrow. Like, yes, it's me. Hello. How you doing? I'm going to eat my sandwich now. Um, but when I went to Shanghai, I remember getting to my room and um, calling uh, uh, housekeeping, asking them for, you know, like, I think like soap or utensils or something or a pen and paper, because I like to carry a pen and paper every, everywhere I go. And uh, she answered the door and it's like she saw five heads on somebody. She was like, hello. I'm like, is everything OK? And she was like, I, I can't believe in broken English. I can't believe I'm. I have this opportunity to meet you right now. Can you sign this for me? I'm like, do does she think I, my first instinct was, oh, she must think I'm somebody else. She must be confused. Like I'm an act, actor or something like right. that. And then it started happening again. And I would go out to eat. And then all of the um, 
the uh, the staff at the restaurant would be excited to see me. I'm like, I I was with my dad. I just brought my dad with me. I was like, why are, I was 23. I was like, why are they excited to see me? And then I heard them singing my song outside of my hotel room. And there was something interesting about the way they were singing, see you again, so see you again. Let me turn this little, I conveniently have a little piano here, the melody. singing along the melody perfectly but kind of messing up the lyrics getting the title right because English not being their first language that's okay but they were getting the melody perfect and then I came back to the United States more people in the United States um, knew uh, knew the song and then I remember going to uh, Denmark a couple like a month later and they were doing the same thing um, that my Chinese fans were doing. They were singing the melody perfect. They were just starting to get the lyrics because they were just starting to hear the song at the dawn of Spotify and everything. Um, at the time we broke a record, three million plays in a day, that gets shattered by everything now. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of dawned on me that the melody is the most important thing uh, for non-English speaking music mm -hmm. avid lovers and listeners. Um, and from that point on, when See You Again came out, I made sure, I told myself, whatever I do, I'm, melody is always going to be the, the focal point, the core of everything. Lyrics are obviously very important, the, the phrase and the, the catchphrase of the song rather being very catchy, but the melody, if you can play it on a violin, if you can play it on a cello, if you can play it on the clarinet, um, if you can take all the production out, all the drums out, all the glitz and glam of it all and just play the melody that's the most important thing and that's what I realized is going to take my music around the world is the melody interesting thought I think that's absolutely true and I think also you were fortunate that, that, that this hit was propelled by this movie and and one thing about action movies that we've learned is they're popular in other parts of the world because some of the subtle nuances of language and culture get lost but car chases and fight scenes. So fun to watch. Yeah, Game of Thrones translates in every, in every culture in some ways. So, so what Absolutely. else have you learned? What else are you thinking about a global audience and how you reach them? And w once pandemic is behind us, will you tour more internationally or, or will you do some international collaborations? I would love to do more. I've, I've been to France and collaborated with local artists there. This wonderful singer named Luann. I went, uh, sang Imagine. On, on RTL Late Night, uh, which is a very popular show in France. That was very, very fun to do that. I, I it, you know, I, I write, it's, it's no coincidence that I've written most of my hits abroad because I'm so inspired by all of, um, all of these different cultures, how watching how people eat, how people talk, how people carry themselves and, and kind of comparing it to how I do it. And I'm, to be a songwriter, if anyone, you know, whoever's uh, a songwriter in here right now, you're usually a pretty empathetic person and empathetic people can kind of read the room very well. We're very good at reading the room, all of us in here. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go to a restaurant and a melody would pop in my head uh, just from, uh, uh, just like the way the fork felt. It's, it's hard to explain, but it's just such a, it's such a strong dichotomy from like going out to eat somewhere here in Los Angeles to going out to eat in Tokyo where the best sushi restaurants are in um, hotels that like don't even have signs. It's, and then you start to think, oh, what, why does it not have a sign? And then you think, oh, the, the sign was an important song in the 1995 produced by Dennis Pop and Max Martin. I wonder if, what, what, what other songs like have that and then you so your brain starts to i don't know you just gotta let your brain free flow that, but that I haven't song had... was impossible not to like even people who tell you they hate that song are lying no that was that's everybody's guilty pleasure it has bounce and that was a very international song too yeah because it had some bounce to it everybody yeah. at the end of the day wants to move everybody wants to dance and have fun even in a global pandemic you look forward to dancing and having fun. Even if you don't know how to dance, dancing is that one thing that everybody will, whatever your version of it is, it's, it's a way of social interaction. Everybody wants to socially interact. Yeah. 
I think what that song also has, which Sting and other people understood, is the power of that reggae bass line kind of feel. And so many songs have that. Some of your stuff has a little bit of that. Your bass lines, I think, are one of, uh, your melodies are great, but those bass lines are killing. I'll pull, I'm pulling up a bass sound right now. Everybody is always asking me what the, who played the bass on attention. That was me yeah. using uh, this plugin right here called Trillion. This is in my little studio right now. And I'll tell you the exact, uh, it was the retro 60s bass. And it just had, yeah, this one right here. And I was on a train in Tokyo. I don't know how well this is going to translate over Zoom, but. Yeah. When I had the. Because it reminded me of like a disco, like a like a hot. What is, what is that? Yeah, like hot, stuff, hot stuff, hot stuff, baby stuff. tonight. The octave up was a very. Fun. You should be dancing. I, that's what I thought of when I did that that bass line. That uh, and it's no way like the same in a songwriting sense, but it just gave me that feeling. Yeah. Give us a little more of that. That sounded mm -hmm. so good. It's, so it goes here. Let me point the camera this way because the speakers will catch up better. So it's. So ba I wish I could play bass and I, I have like my little mini Moog over there. I'm obsessed with low end coming from a hip hop background. So I, and I, I, pl I played piano, which is kind of, it kind of takes up the, uh, the top register of things. So I always wondered what it was like to, uh, you know, to really focus on melody in the low end, like yeah. 32 Hertz and to 80 Hertz. What did, how, how much melody can you get away with without it overlapping um, with the other melody? Cause there's a lot of melody in this. So as a result of that, you have to uh, make your high end melody much simpler, but it all has to kind of perfectly fit in the pocket because there's there's two melodies going on at the same yeah, time. It's a, it's a counter melody that works. Mm -hmm. And then you got a great groove that kind of locks the whole thing down. It's it's like how Johann Sebastian Bach would write fugues in the 14th, 15th century, Yeah, I think. Um, and there would be counterpart melody and it would all just be catchy at the same time. I believe Bach was the first person to write catchy melodies in like a very easily digestible form for at the time, pop music, popular music. Yeah. Yeah, I think a good counter melody uh, is a powerful thing and bass players who can hear that. And, and uh, that's, I think the bass players we love are the ones who get that. But I, I've just been very impressed by how one thing I've also noticed about you, Charlie, is you have a, an encyclopedic memory of music from the from the past that you draw on just to inspire you. Like, what were some of the early influences that you grew up with before you were conscious of someday maybe wanting to be a, a working musician? I, rem I, I remember um, hearing uh, and living in Massachusetts for four years. This is appropriate, but... Uh, I don't know how well this is going to sound right now. I'm going to drop the key. It's very early where Charlie is in LA. I, 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 it'll go a little off key right now, but hopefully not. I remember hearing this song, the James Taylor, Shower the People, when you can play the game, you can not tell the part, but you know it wasn't written for you. When I heard the no, no, it wasn't written. Because usually you would go, no, it wasn't written for you. But you kind of follow the chords, but he stayed on that A flat, in this case, an A flat. Even though it wasn't written for you. And I would hear that, that tension, and I'd be like, there's nowhere else to go except to resolve. And that was maybe the first, it, mm, at like seven years old, me kind of realizing without a teacher telling me that usually hit songs are, are just great songs are usually made with tension and release, tension and release. And that happened, that happening constantly because it's just so, it's, it's kind of like, 
it's ASMR for for music in a way. It's so it, it, it's so satisfying. That's the best word to describe it. It's so satisfying when something is rubbing against a chord that you know is going to eventually resolve. Um, so James Taylor playing the guitar like a piano player was very inspiring to me. And, uh, and then going to Berkeley and uh, being told about kind of avant-garde uh, jazz artists and jazz groups like the Yellow Jackets, like the, the, the Spirit of the West, if anybody knows that, it's like a super cool record. There's tension and release all over in that. Um, Bill Evans, uh, But Beautiful, Emily, all these great jazz records. Everything is kind of recycled into each other. And you listen to Chick Corea, God rest his soul. He just he just uh, moved on. Uh, you listen to a record like Spain, and I hear I heard that record and thought, wow, I can make a pop song off of Chick's melodies. And it's uh, and it's all based on tension and release. So there's, I mean, it's endless amounts of artistry. Some of Chick's songs have like ten or fifteen potential songs in God, but there's so many melodies going on. I'm not even going to pretend I know how to play Spain correctly right now, but just pretend I do. <laughs> hey, uh, Charlie, I, I wanted to tell you something. We're doing in Abu Dhabi. We've got a program we're calling the Pearl Program. Oh which is uh, performance, artist, artistry, and leadership, where we're going to bring some great musicians, up-and-coming musicians from around the Middle East, North Africa, and within the United Arab Emirates, help them uh, write, record uh, a three-song EP, and try to help them develop the social media marketing skills and other tools to get their music out to the world. So, yeah. What are your thoughts? Like, when you were... I mean, you were you were ahead of the curve, but if you were a young artist, what what would be some of the things you'd want to get out of a program like that? I would want, well, I would hope someone would tell me to what on whatever, uh, whatever platform it is, what if it's Spotify, if it's TikTok, if it's YouTube, that would to be it would be to chase great. Jimmy Iovine always told me to. Uh, chase great when i was signed to interscope very briefly i remember him tell that was one of the first things that that he told me and whether great is on tiktok whether great is on spotify it's it, if it's if it's great and you're excited to play it for your friends it's going to translate to the rest of the world so if the prime focus right now um is tiktok don't try and make a tiktok make i mean yes make it you know, make it brief, make it concise, make it like appealing as possible, but make it something that you, if it's a song, if it's a snippet of a song, make sure it's something that you're, if you have a neighbor, you're running over to their house and playing it for them, or you're playing it for your best friend. You're excited to show people in real life because if the song's no good and you're like, eh, it's all right, I have better stuff up my sleeve, make sure you show the better stuff up your sleeve because mm -hmm. as, as hot of a platform TikTok is, it's not going to, it's not going to make your song you kind of are iffy about mm -hmm. translate well. You got to be passionate about it. Yeah, I do think that young artists sometimes there's a certain kind of insecurity, and it makes them feel bad when they have to revise or rewrite or work or tweak when in fact that's the very thing they need to do. Because the more you, you should you should hear what we don't talk anymore sounded like when I first made it. <laughs> But I knew I was confident in it. But I, the first demo, not good. Yeah. But no one will ever hear that, by the way. But <laughs> I knew it was good. Yeah, I mean, you have to have that. That it's a complicated thing. You have to have that deep confidence in yourself that you've got something important to say. But then you got to be hard enough on yourself to say, "I'm not there yet. This can mm -hmm. be better. Let me keep at it." Um, and I do think that the the the. Some people, especially some of the more jazz oriented people at Berkeley, I think misunderstand how difficult it is to write a brilliant popular music hit. Um, well, it's all it's all about you can put I put I made my career off of sneaking jazz into pop music. But unless you want to make a, uh, a 
like a, a smooth jazz like pop record which you totally can i still listen to those they're they're great and there's an entire channel on Sirius dedicated to those there's a whole career in that as well but if you want to make pop music and sneak in you know the she said boy tell me honestly was he real just for sure those are all those are all R&B jazzish chords that I learned at Berkeley. That sound, but like it's all the sound choice. Like I didn't use it, it's a trade-off. So if you don't want it to sound like a complete jazz record, instead of this sound, you save that for the live coffee house version. You do a synth <laughs> sound instead of that. Well, I think that's part of your genius. Uh, that, that's another part of tension in release. If you do a pure jazz record in the pop world, that would just be tension, tension. Mm -hmm. But if you put a little bit of it in and resolve it back to very familiar things, then that is a form of tension and release. This jazz in pop music has never been more relevant. You go on TikTok, you hear all. I don't know the name of the song. I just always hear it on TikTok. <laughs> two, five, one. They, I mean, kids on TikTok don't know what two, five, ones are, but we do. <laughs> Yeah, but and I think that this the judicious knowledge of when to use that and when not to. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day about John Mayer, another one of our. I just spoke to him last night. He has an amazing album that he's working on. Uh, that guy is so talented. And I was listening to his first record again mm -hmm. and thinking, how does he at such a young age with so many guitar chops know not to show them all off? You know, like it, it, it. It's, it's such maturity to mm -hmm. not overwhelm us with everything he knows how to do and instead give us something that is really appropriate for the song. And I think that's a hard thing for the kind of Berkeley student to do. Like I always felt if I had the chop to some of those Berkeley drummers, I would overplay everything because I just want to hear all those things, but it doesn't really serve the song. So how did you get the maturity to know when to use those things and when to hold back? Just people's reactions. I remember. I would burn and you know when people burn cds and tapes yep. i would strategically place and i was in seventh grade this was 2005 i would place a 50 cent song right before an eminem song because i knew kids in my school liked eminem just a little bit more than 50 cent than the kids in new york did i was living in new jersey so i would leave track five which was like the hit song like because I, I bought Get Rich or Die Trying, which was an album by 50 Cent, and they saved track five for In the Club, which was the big hit at the time. So I wanted to make a mixtape with Tre where track five was the big hit. And I knew that at this party I was going to, all my friends were going to go crazy when they heard track five. You have to be going against saying empathetic to people's feelings and kind of listening patterns. You're, you're listening, you're, John Mayer is smart where he knows that not everybody's going to understand. I want to run, da, 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 da. I want to scream at the top of my lungs. So he doesn't do the electric piano. He gets John Alasia to put like this at the time, like kind of current, like drum Dave Matthews groove, which was what everybody was listening to in 2001. And couple in with like a guitar, a bright acoustic guitar, which is very, very Ryan Cabrera at the time pop energy which still holds up today so it's just being empathetic and knowing that you know you want your music to be easily digestible by yeah. other people john said an interesting thing at a clinic he did at berkeley he said you know it's, if you want to do esoteric music more power to you you know i admire it i love it i grew up with it but if you want to do music that lots of people listen to there's a different set of rules and you just have to you have to be yeah. writing for the people you want to listen to it as opposed to writing and doing what you want to do. And both are legitimate. You just need to decide which one is your path. Both are legitimate. I, I want to one day just do a jazz record. But if after this record I'm working on, which is a pop record, I want to do, like I always, everybody, you know, <laughs> makes fun of me, but I really love that Rod Stewart, Great American Classics album. I thought that was brilliant when him and Clive put that together. And it's how I learned all those songs. Yeah, well, I think uh, I could easily see you doing sort of what John did with Herbie Hancock. I could see mm -hmm. you doing a collaboration like that where you show people some of the chops that, that we can hear in the music, but you're not, you're not really leading with that in, in the more popular-oriented writing you're doing. It's so fun to just sneak those little 
Berkeleyisms. Yeah. I call them Berkeleyisms in yeah. into your pop music. Another one of those. Mm -hmm. I have. Uh, well, I'll I'll play. Listen to this. Is how attention originally sounded when I when I wrote it. The chorus. Full of two five ones and everything across the board. It's pleasing to my ear, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to put it in the track ever so slightly yeah. and it's kill two birds with one stone. Every, all the music heads are going to appreciate it. And all of the avid pop listeners are going to appreciate it as well. Yeah. I, I fell in love with turmeric recently mm. and, I, and I kept putting more and more turmeric into things until I reached a point where there was too much of it. Yeah. Well, maybe for a good reason. You don't want to put too much of that in your, exactly. I, I have turmeric creamer. Now, there, there are spices that, that are good when you can barely taste them, but if they start to overwhelm the, uh, the dish, then maybe too much. Exactly. Um, so, so tell us what, what's next. What are you working on? What, are, what, what should we be looking forward to seeing coming out of the Charlie Puth camp? I'm not going to go completely dark. I'm definitely in this next month focusing on like making, I want to make the best album. I want best like pop album at the Grammys. Mm -hmm. um I've, de I've i've had i've been nominated for best engineer i've had many nominations but i want to actually like win one yeah. this time and that's not we don't make music for the grammys it's just kind of a personal goal of mine and i just want to make the best album ever that people coming out of this pandemic can be inspired by and because if i wasn't being if i wasn't if i weren't a musician i would be a teacher um and that's the honest truth I have so much respect for teachers and I just like am enamored with how they uh, are able to uh, process and, and give information. Um, and I hope that I'd be able to do that with a, a feasible piece of uh, art, which is an album for me. So that's what I'm working on. I'm spending the next month and just really finalizing that. Yeah. So will you be working with some session musicians or will you be doing a lot of it yourself? What, what's your- It's gonna be all here. I got my NS10s for- <laughs> A flat mix. I got my Moog. I got all my keyboards. I'm kind of missing a couch right now, but that's gonna eventually get here. Those some drums you got back there. That's my little album list of what I uh that or my mom took a picture of a Beatles picture and then framed it for me. That was okay. very nice of her. Um. Well, we'll we'll have to get you to come to Abu Dhabi someday and, and oh my see gosh, the facility there. Uh, you know, we're doing the Power Station Recording Studio in New York City now, where so many seminal records like Born in the USA and, uh, and the That's right. really stuff were done. So uh, I would love that. We're, we're, our goal is to, is to be wherever you go in the world. And uh, uh, really, really so impressed with everything you've done, Charlie. And you've been, always been so generous to support Berkeley and... Um, and all your I'm, insp I'm inspired by students. I'm inspired by people who just are may, are doing what they love right now and not exactly focusing on having a hit record. They're just excited to play music for their friends because that's how hits are made. You, everybody watching now is the future, actually the future. It's like the limbs are relaxed. You're not trying to be anything right now except the best version of yourself. And when you're trying to be the best version of yourself, it translates in your music. And that's how new music is made. Yeah. Well, take us out with a little something. I think, how about a happy one? It's been a long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. Get it? You've come a long way from where we began. Oh, I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. That was hot.
high up for 8 a.m. That was that was impressive for 8 a.m. People don't oh know how much that is to do. Uh, hey, Charlie, let me just thank you again. And everyone out there listening, go check out Charlie Puth. He's got an amazing array of great music and more coming. Uh, we'll be in touch soon. And again, thanks so much for being part of this, Charlie. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, everyone, for watching, too. And to all the Puth family, I've gotten to know them all. Good luck to you all. We love you, too. I'll send you everything.